This is Physics 1060, Lecture 8, and today we're going to start talking about small planetary bodies. We'll begin with talking about the satellites of the outer moons. All of the Jovian planets have many moons. We can see here some of the largest ones and their size comparison to Earth. And we see that some of these moons are fairly large. Now, moons are of very great interest to astronomers because they have more to tell us than the planets themselves do. If something happens to the surface of Jupiter, it's a fluid planet, and so the disturbance gets stirred up and forgotten. However, a solid surface has a lot more memory. So photographs of the moons of the planets are often much more useful than photographs of the planets themselves. The spacecraft that have visited the outer planets spend at least as much time looking at the moons of the planets than the planets themselves. Now Jupiter currently has 63 natural satellites or moons. That number changes as more are discovered. And the four innermost, of course, are called the Galilean moons. Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Now except for Europa, all are larger than the moon. Ganymede is the largest moon in the solar system, and it actually has its own magnetic field. And they were formed in a process similar to the formation of the solar system. The density of the satellites decreases with distance from Jupiter. Io, we see here from pictures, is an active planet. Here is a cloud of a volcanic eruption, essentially liquid sulfur coming out of the middle of it, that uh, was captured by a space probe as it goes by. Now, the reason it's so active is it has gravitational tidal forces from Jupiter and Europa that keep Io's interior hot. What's going on is because one part of Io is closer to Jupiter than the other, it stretches, and then as it turns, it continues to stretch in different directions, causing the rocks to move across each other, and that friction generates heat, which keeps Io very hot on in the interior. Europa has very few craters on the surface, and it indicates that there's some heating, probably by tidal forces from Jupiter, and maybe some radioactive decay of elements in the interior. The surface looks like a cracked egg, indicating that there's a flow similar to glaciers on Earth. And the heating is probably enough to keep a layer of water melted below the ice crust. So if we were to look at a cross-section of Europa, we say it probably has a metallic core and then a rocky interior, but with the ice layer on the outside, there's probably about a hundred mile thick layer of liquid ocean under the ice. This actually is one of the reasons that Europa is one of the places in the universe, or in our solar system at least, where we want to look for other life, um, maybe something growing in the liquid ocean. And again, I mean Callisto, kind of look like the moon, with grayish brown color and covered with craters. However, those surfaces are mostly ice, and we can see the craters are all white, so it's a dust covering on top of an ice ball, essentially, and whenever a crater hits, it blows that white ice out. Callisto may also have subsurface liquid water. Ganymede is less cratered than Callisto, indicating Mariah-type formations, although tectonic movement can't be ruled out. Now, by looking at the average density of the Galilean moons, their interior is composed mainly of rocky material. Differentiation may have allowed iron to sink to the core. The rest of Jupiter's moons are much smaller than the Galilean satellites, and they are cratered. The outermost moons have orbits of high inclination, suggesting they're probably captured asteroids. They weren't um, created and formed in the same manner as the Galilean moons. Saturn has several large moons and a lot of smaller ones. And like Jupiter, most of the moons form a mini solar system, but unlike Jupiter, Saturn's moons are of similar densities, indicating they were not heated by Saturn as they formed. Saturn's moons have a smaller density than those of Jupiter, indicating that their interiors are mostly ice. Most moons are inundated with craters, many of which are surrounded by white markings that show that shattered ice. And the moons also have several features that have yet to be explained. Here we see some pictures of that. Titan, which we'll talk about in a minute. Mimas, which looks like the prototype of the Death Star, has a very large crater on one surface. Some of the others have these strange formations, uh, strange terrain that we're not sure about. 
but they're all different. They all are mostly ice. Titan is Saturn's largest moon. It's actually larger than Mercury and has a mostly nitrogen atmosphere. It has a solid surface with liquid oceans of methane. And the Huygens probe actually landed on the surface of Titan. The Cassini space probe showed many things about the surface, including rivers and seas. However, all these rivers and seas and dune surfaces, the, the liquid that we see in all these is liquid methane. Uranus has five large moons and several small ones that form a regular system. Moons are probably composed of ice and rock, and many show heavy cratering. Now, Miranda is a very unique moon, and it appears to be torn apart several times and reassembled. So something large hit it, broke it into pieces, and the pieces came back together. Triton's orbit is backwards and is highly tilted with respect to New Neptune's equator. So Triton is perhaps ca a captured planetesimal from the Kuiper belt. Triton is large enough and far enough from the planet to retain an atmosphere. It has some craters with dark streaks extending from them, and at least one of which originates from a geyser caught in eruption when Voyager 2 passed it. The material in the geyser is thought to be a mixture of nitrogen, ice, and carbon compounds heated beneath the surface by sunlight until it expands and bursts into the surface. Here we see the surface of Triton, and it's got some strange features, some wrinkled terrain, and this is a picture from Voyager 2, and we see here windblown volcanic debris. That brings us now to Pluto. Now, Pluto was discovered in 1913 by the examination of photographic plates. Here we have two plates taken at different times, and we see here these four stars, and we see this star right here. And we look further at these stars, and the fourth star is missing. In fact, over here we see two bright stars, two small ones, and a single. And over here we see the two bright stars, two small ones, a single, and another one. The only way we get a moving object from one to the other is if it is in our solar system in orbit around the sun. Now, in 1978, Pluto was discovered to have a moon. We called it Charon. And Pluto and Charon are closer in size to each other than any other planet-moon pair, and so some people regard them as a double planet. Charon orbits Pluto every six hours, every six days and nine hours. The recent eclipses of Pluto with Charon have allowed the radii of both objects to be determined. Pluto is a fifth the diameter of Earth, and Charon is about half of Pluto's diameter. From the masses and diameters, Pluto's density is 2.1 grams per cu cubic centimeter, suggesting an object of water, ice, and rock. So if we were to make a guess, we would see that most of Pluto is water ice with a small rock and iron core. This is a Hubble Space Telescope picture of Pluto and Charon, its moon. This is as good of an image as we can get. Now it's been speculated that Pluto and perhaps Charon as well were once moons of Neptune because Nep uh, Pluto crosses Neptune's orbit some of the time. Um, actually, from 1979 through 1999, Pluto was inside the orbit of Neptune, which means it was actually closer to the Sun than Neptune was. Now, they are so far away that finding out even the basics as mass and size are getting are very difficult. Our best estimate to date of Pluto's mass is about 1 400th that of Earth. So due to the small mass, there's been some discussion as whether it is a planet at all. As you know, it was recently removed from planet status. It turns out to be about the same size as our moon. Now due to its small mass and size, gravity on the surface is only 1% that of the Earth. So our 180-pound man that we've talked about would only weigh 1.8 pounds on the surface of Pluto. Pluto takes 248 Earth years to complete its trip around the Sun, and its path around the Sun is 30 degrees off the ecliptic. Some more pictures of Pluto and Charon. We can see how similar in size they are. This also gives you a size comparison of Pluto and Charon with respect 
to the Earth. In, um, in particular, we see that Pluto is about the size as western United States. Now in 2005, Pluto was discovered to have a third and fourth moon, called Nix and Hydra. Two more were discovered in 2011 and 2012. Now, there was a 2013 poll that said that um, people would like one of those moons to be named Vulcan, and so we'll see what happens. Currently, their official names are P4 and P5 for the fourth and fifth moons. Pluto is not massive enough to retain much of an atmosphere. But in the 80s, infrared spectroscopy showed there was a methane atmosphere. Due to the orbit's high eccentricity, Pluto's atmosphere will freeze out for part of its year. The atmosphere is composed mostly of nitrogen gas, carbon monoxide, and some traces of methane. From the density of Pluto, again, we know it cannot be composed of solid rock. It must be made of frozen materials around a rocky core. The surface temperature of Pluto should be about 400 degrees below zero. The Pluto-Charon system represents one of the wide-open frontiers in the solar system. No spacecraft has ever visited Pluto and Charon. And its angular diameter is only about a tenth of an arc second at best, which is just about at the resolving limit of the Hubble Space Telescope. Now we do have a mission to visit Pluto, and it was launched in 2006. It will actually arrive in 2015. It's called New Horizons. And after Pluto, Pluto it'll travel through the Kuiper Belt. So what is the Kuiper Belt? Starting in 1992, astronomers became aware that there was a vast population of small bodies orbiting the Sun beyond Neptune. In the last decade, dozens more objects have been discovered with orbits beyond the orbit of Neptune in the range of 30 to 50 astronomical units. It's estimated that there may be more than 70,000 of these objects altogether. And observations show that these objects are mostly confined within a thick band around the ecliptic, leading to the realization that they occupy a ring or belt around the Sun. The ring is generally referred to as the Kuiper Belt. The objects are called Kuiper Belt Objects, or KBOs, and are important because they're probably similar to the th primitive lumps of material which the planets formed out of billions of years ago. It's widely believed that the Kuiper Belt is the source of short-period comets, it acts as a reservoir of these bodies in the same way that the Oort cloud acts as a reservoir for long-period comets. Now, the way we find Kuiper Belt objects is through a blink sequence. It's essentially the same way we found Pluto. Astronomers will take a certain area of the sky and take a picture of it, and they'll take more pictures, and they'll survey the sky, and then they'll go back, and they'll line up digitally the same picture and they'll look for any objects that move from time to time. Anything that moves with respect to the background stars over a short period of time has got to be in our solar system and so we've found all these Kuiper Belt objects using these blink sequences. So there's all these maybe 70,000 more objects out there. How do we decide what's a planet and what's not? So the definition of planet was set in 2006 by the IAU, or the International Astronomical Union. And it states that a solar system, in our solar system, a planet is a celestial body that, one, is in orbit around the sun, two, has sufficient mass to assume hydrostatic equilibrium, means it's in a round ball shape, and three, has cleared the neighborhood around its orbit. A non-satellite body fulfilling only the first two of these criteria is classified as a dwarf planet. So a dwarf planet is a celestial body that is orbit around the sun, has sufficient mass for self-gravity to overcome rigid forces so it, it comes to a round shape, and has not cleared the neighborhood around its orbit, or is not a satellite. All other objects except satellites orbiting the sun are referred to collectively as small solar system bodies. Because Pluto still has other objects that pass through its orbit, it has been demoted to a dwarf planet. There's still debate about this. However, it's not alone. There are many dwarf planets. 
Triton could almost be considered a planet, except it's a moon. Of course, Pluto and Charon. But we see Eris is another object out in the Kuiper Belt. It's actually as big as Triton and bigger than Pluto and Charon. Or um, this one's called 2005 FY9. It was discovered in 2009. It hasn't been named yet because people are arguing who discovered it first. Orcus, Sedna. Uh, these are all objects that are um, quite large compared to other things in our solar system. But all of them cross paths with each other at some point in time. And so they haven't earned the status planet of cleaning out its orbit of all other objects. As time goes by, we've discovered more and more. 2003 EL61 is another object. It's hydrostatic. It isn't round, probably because it was spinning so much around this axis. You see, there's many more different dwarf planets with different sizes, and we have com compare these to the size of the Earth here. If we treat Pluto the same as anything else its size and in its condition, then either all of these would have to have been called planets or they're all dwarf planets, and the IAU decided it would be best to call them dwarf planets. This graphic shows you where a lot of these dwarf planets orbit. We have the Sun, Uranus, the blue orbit is Neptune, uh, this red orbit here is Pluto, but we see there's many other objects that are in different elliptical orbits. They all cr orbits cross each other, so none of them could be called a planet. Eventually, as they cross over a very long amount of time, there's some probability that they'll collide with each other and form a larger object. Eventually, when that larger object has collected all of these smaller dwarf planets, it will have cleared the neighborhood of all of its uh, competitors and will have a s new planet. Now, the next small planetary body I want to talk about is asteroids. They're small, generally rocky, bodies that orbit the Sun. And most, or thousands of them, lie in what we call the asteroid belt. It's a region between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. The first asteroid, Ceres, was dis uh, of this asteroid belt swarm was discovered in 1801 as a result of something called the missing planet. Uh, Bode was looking at uh, ratios of where all the planets were. He predicted there would be another planet between Mars and Jupiter. And looking for it, we saw the asteroid. Now, the combined mass of all the asteroids is probably less than one one-thousandth of the mass of the Earth. This picture shows the asteroid belt. Now, not all asteroids lie in the same place. Here we have the orbit of Mars and the orbit of Earth. Notice some asteroids are actually inside, and they'll actually cross paths with Earth. So those are the ones we're worried about. We'll talk about that later. This object, uh, region between Mars and Jupiter, is called the asteroid belt. And there's some asteroid belts called Trojan asteroids that are about in Jupiter's orbit that lead and lag Jupiter by actually exactly 30 degrees from the center. And we'll talk about those more later. Now, the uh, region between Mars and Jupiter isn't th so thick with asteroids we can't really see out. Each of these dots represents an object that on the scale of this picture would be completely invisible. But they needed to be a large enough dot in order to be able to see them graphically. Now, asteroids are small, so their sizes are best determined from infrared measurements. Bigger bodies emit more IR than smaller ones at the same temperature. Asteroids range in size from 1,000 kilometers across, Ceres, down to kilometer-sized objects, or some even smaller. Because asteroids are small, they have low gravity and no atmosphere. Also, they can have irregular shapes, since weak gravity is not good at pulling planets into round shapes. So most asteroids are irregularly shaped as determined from spacecraft images and from brightness fluctuations seen through telescopes. Reflection spectra show that asteroids belong to three main compositional groups. Carbonaceous bodies, silicate bodies, and metallic iron nickel bodies. Inner belt asteroids tend to be silicate rich and outer belt tend to be carbon rich. And some asteroids are loose lumps of material just held together by gravity. We can see this object. It might be a larger object back here, but there's lots of small 
chunks that are just have come together over time and are stuck due to the small gravity between them. So from their composition, size, and location, asteroids support the solar nebula hypothesis and are thought to be fragments of planetesimals. Now for this connection to be established, differentiation needed to occur in the large asteroids. Fragmentation of the early large asteroids, planetesimals, through collisions created by stony and iron asteroids we see today. The asteroid belt is the result of Jupiter disturbing the accretion process in that zone and presenting a planet from forming in that zone. So what do I mean by they must be differentiated? Here's two pictures of a non-differentiated asteroid and a differentiated one. In the non-differentiated, we have a mixture of iron, nickel, and rock all throughout. The differentiated one, the radioactive heating melts the material so the iron and nickel sinks to the core and the rock and other materials left on the outside. Now, if I have a differentiated asteroid and it's broken up by a collision, we should get some fragments that are completely iron and nickel and some fragments that are rock which if we look at things that have fallen to the earth out there this is exactly what we see. Now the near mission or the near earth asteroid rendezvous put a spacecraft in orbit around the asteroid Eros and actually landed on it in 2001 and sent back data for several days but the camera did not survive the landing. This was basically because there was no landing gear on it. This spacecraft was sent to Eros and went into orbit around it to take pictures and uh, take some data. After a while, when they had done all the scientific experimentation that they could, the engineers at NASA said, well, what can we do now? So they decided, well, let's try to land it. There's no landing gear, uh, but they did have enough fuel to attempt to slow down and to land. And these are pictures of it as it's getting closer. And we see craters uh, as micrometeorites struck the surface. It's pitted with large and small craters all over the surface. And we see a picture here of the surface taken by the camera, which was looking straight down at 250 meters. And the last photo taken, uh, the picture was taken, and as it was transmitted, it hit and knocked uh, the, the camera out and damaged it slightly so that the um, spacecraft sent this last row of pixels over and over and over again. There weren't these straight striations on the planet. Uh, as it was transmitting here, it transmitted the same thing over and over and over since it was broken, didn't have landing gear when it landed. Now the Apollo asteroids are asteroids that actually are carried into the solar system and cross the Earth's orbit. There are about 700 of these and they represent a collision probability with Earth once every 10,000 years. These could be dead comets that are shifted into their orbits by Jupiter. They're devoid of surface ice um, because they've come to to the sun too much and melted off all the ice. Uh, these are the ones I said that we're worried about. So comets. Comets travel in elliptical or parabolic orbits. And they reach the outer edge of the solar system and maybe beyond. Halley has a 76 year orbit. It reaches beyond the planet Neptune. It passed close to us in 1986. The next time is in 2061. It's called Halley's Comet because Edmund Halley was the first person to understand comets were in orbit around the sun and the first person to predict the return of any comet. In 1705, he used the theory of gravity to predict the return in 1758 from reports on comets in 1531, 1607, and 1682. He actually never saw it return. He died 16 years before it did. However, it did so it still bears his name. More recently, we've had some spectacular comets like hale bopp at the top and Hayataki at the bottom. Neither of these comets, which were visible at one time, will ever return in our lifetime. Some pictures of hale bopp and we can see how large it is across, um, across the sky. It was actually quite visible, and we can see there's this blue tail and this white tail, which we'll talk about in a second. Hayakutake was in 1996, and it was also a very brilliant with a large tail behind it. Pan-STARRS is a comet which came by in 2013. It was actually uh, visible in the night sky by the moon uh, this March. You can see it 
uh, here above the Washington Monument. It's very small um, in this, so if, um, it's kind of hard to see, but at night, um, it's still close to the sun at this point, we could see it. Now the structure of a comet has a tail. It's a nail, narrow column of gas and dust, and that tail can stretch over a hundred million kilometers. The coma is extremely rarefied gas atmosphere that reaches to about 100,000 kilometers around the nucleus. The nucleus is a dirty snowball, roughly 10 kilometers across, containing most of the comet's mass. Now, the Guiado spacecraft um, was sent to the Halley's Comet to determine the nucleus density, and the density was about 0.2 grams per cubic centimeter. So that comets are fluffy material. It's not a compact, solid piece of ice. It's pieces of ice and snow that have gathered together in the outer solar system. The nucleus was odd-shaped, and it had uh, dark, which is uh, carbon-rich material, um, gas that was coming out in jets as it heated up around the sun. So this picture shows us a little bit better. We have the tail, which goes off behind the comet. We have the head of the comet. Inside we have the, com the hydrogen envelope, then we have the coma, and then we have the nucleus. The spectra of coma and tail shows comets are rich in water, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and small amounts of other gases. Evaporating water is disassociated by solar ultraviolet radiation creating a large hydrogen cloud around the comet. And repeated passage by the sun eventually erodes the comet's gas production ability. Now where do comets come from? Most comets come from the Oort cloud, which is a spherical shell of trillions of icy bodies believed to lie far beyond Pluto's orbit at a distance of about 150,000 astronomical units. This picture shows um, this spherical distribution of the Oort cloud, and inside we see the, Cooper, uh, the Kuiper belt, and we have the orbit of Neptune. So typical comet orbits come well outside this, go in past the sun, and come back out. Now, originally orbiting among the giant planets were planetesimals, and comets were tossed into the Oort cloud by these planets. The shape of the Oort cloud is determined from observation of comet orbits. Some comet orbits seem to come from the flatter, less remote region, the Kuiper belt, which extends from Neptune's orbit. Comets in the Oort cloud are very cold, about three degrees above absolute zero, and only warm, enough to, warm up enough to emit gas when they enter the solar system. Essentially, when they pass Jupiter and are closer to the sun as Jupiter, they start to give off gas and they become visible. So how do they come out of the Oort cloud? Well, the sun's gravitational attraction pulls it and it causes it to be in an orbit. So perhaps this was the original orbit of the comet. And something happens, a supernova shock wave or a passing star or uh, two objects come too close to each other. And when that happens, it causes it to either slow down or something happens and it falls into a new orbit that goes close to the sun. Now what do we see in the comet's tail? Well, as it gets warmer by the sun, and pieces and parts start to come off, dust particles are struck by photons and are pushed away from the sun. So solar photons, which is the same thing as sunlight, exerts a pressure on these and causes them to be pushed away. We call that radiation pressure, and it drives emitted cometary dust into a dust tail. A second tail, called a gas tail, is created by the interaction of the comet's emitted gas and the solar wind. Since both the solar wind and solar radiation move away from the sun, comet trails always point away from the sun. The gas tail is blue, the dust tail is white, and the dust tail points directly away from the sun. The gas tail moves off to the side because these are all objects in orbit around the sun. The further they are away, the slower they go, and so the gas tail tends to get pushed um, off to the side just due to the differential rotation around the sun. So if we look at a comet's journey, it comes in, uh, gas begins to evaporate, and a coma forms around it when it's three astronomical units from the sun. 
the tail starts to form and so the tail is always pointing away from the sun after it goes around the sun the tail is still pointing away from the sun and eventually all this material goes off uh, the stuff close by may uh, refreeze on it and as it gets far enough away it's no more materials coming off and it goes back on its orbit. Now most comets seen on Earth are one-time visitors meaning they have periods of thousands or maybe millions of years. A small number of comets have periods less than 200 years and they're called short period comets. And repeated passages around the Sun eventually deplete the comet of all of its icy material. Short period comets are now believed to be icy nuclei from the Kuiper Belt. And support of this comes from the detection of many small icy bodies orbiting near or somewhat beyond Pluto. Statistical analysis indicates that the Kuiper Belt may have a total mass far greater than that found in the asteroid belt. Typically one can see a meteor in the clear dark sky about every 15 minutes. And most of these meteors are fragments of asteroids or comet debris that arrive on the Earth randomly. Meteors seen at a faster rate, one every few minutes or less, and that all come from the same general direction are called meteor showers. Here's a time exposure of a meteor shower that seems to be coming from this point in sky. The point in sky that all of them seem to be coming from is called the radiant. A meteor shower is a result that a comet is filling its orbit with emitted dust and the Earth passes through that dust-filled comet orbit. So the Perseus meteor showered uh, is, comes from the orbit of an old comet and it, that orbit is filled of debris from um, past trips around the Sun. And as the Earth comes by then, this orbit material comes in and it appears to strike and it strikes actually just before dawn. Usually meteor showers are good from 2 to 4 a.m. And they all appear to come, in this case, from the constellation Perseus. Meteor showers are typically named after the constellation where the radiant is located. The Perseid meteor shower, the radiant is in the constellation Perseus. Comets burn themselves out and eventually die. Uh, alternative fates are to crash into the sun or into planets. Comet Shoemaker-Levy broke up and actually hit Jupiter in 1994. We couldn't see it because it hit on the back side of Jupiter, but we see here the scars as different fragment pieces uh, hit Jupiter. The scars were visible for a very short time until they eventually faded away. Now a shooting star is that streak of light that appears at night sky for a fraction of a second is a meteor. A meteor is a glowing trail of hot gas and vaporized debris left by a solid object heated by friction as it moves through the Earth's atmosphere, generally right at the upper fringes. If the solid body is still in space, it's called a meteoroid. So a meteoroid is an object in space, a meteor is one that's passing through our atmosphere. Now as they go through the atmosphere, they might be moving at 20,000 miles an hour. So they're heated to thousands of degree Kelvin. They convert their kinetic energy into heating the meteor and the air molecules. Meteoroids larger than a few centimeters are sometimes visible in daylight as fireballs. Hundreds of tons of me meteoric material hit the Earth each day. The best time to observe meteors is from midnight to dawn. Now most meteors are too small to reach the Earth's surface. However, some do, and we call those meteorites. So meteoroids are chunks of objects in space. Meteors are things passing through our atmosphere. And meteorites are what happens when they hit the ground. Now, it's not unlikely that you'll get hit by a meteor. Here is a BBC article about a 14-year-old girl who was hit by a small meteor in 2002. I have other ones you can search for, for a 76-year-old woman who was hit in 2004, or a 14-year-old boy hit in 2009 in Germany. This young lady here um, was getting into the family car outside of her home in Great Britain and was hit by a stone that fell from the sky, and she noticed it was quite hot. She took it to a local university, and they identified it as a meteorite. 
It's another article about the woman who was hanging out the wash, Pauline Agus, and she was hit by one in her left arm, left an inch-long gash in her forearm. Or this 14-year-old who was hit by a 30,000-mile-per-hour space meteorite. Uh, probably slowed down some as it was going through the atmosphere, but he saw a bright light heading straight towards him, and a red-hot pea-sized rock hit his hand, uh, probably at a glancing bow, blow, and caused a foot-wide crater in the ground. If it would have hit his hand straight on or his head, it might not have been such a fun story. So these objects do strike the Earth, and we can pick them up and study them. And when we do, we can use the same radioactive age dating techniques as we've talked about before. And when we do, we see that most meteorites have the same age, about 4.6 billion years. And they are believed to date from the formation of the solar system. By studying their crystals, we hope to determine a lot about the early planets and how they were put together in the history of our solar system. For example, we can deduce that iron meteorites came from a fairly large object that got broken up due to the specific ratios of impurities in many of the iron meteorites that land on Earth. A few meteorites came from the Moon, and we do have some place, some that come from Mars, and we can tell by the ratio of different elements in them. The best place on Earth to find them is in Antarctica. Any rocks that we see on top of the ice in Antarctica, we know, had to have fallen from the sky. There are now serious attempts to devise ways of protecting the Earth from a major meteorite impact. And the Space Guard Survey is um, one that's being studied right now that proposes a major program of telescope surveys. This picture off to the side is an artist's conception. This is an actual picture. You would have heard about this. Of a fairly large asteroid striking the surface of the Earth. If one this size, say the size of the United States, actually hit, uh, this wave of ma debris material could be uh, several hundred miles high and would move at the speed of sound around the Earth. So we don't want this to happen. We want to be able to determine if something's coming at us, maybe be able to do something about it before it actually does. But it happens. Every few thousand years, Earth is hit by a huge meteoroid, a body tens of meters or more in size. A typical 100 kilogram meteoroid has the kinetic energy equivalent of 100 tons of dynamite, which would make a crater 30 meters across, or 100 feet. A 10 meter meteoroid has the explosive power of a thermonuclear bomb and would leave a kilometer wide crater in the ground. Large meteorites have been hitting the Earth for a long time and they can cause disasters. For example, the Behringer Crater in Arizona that we've seen before formed about 50,000 years ago, and this was due to a meteorite the size of a house. Again, you can see the four-lane road coming into this to tell you how big something the size of a house hitting us at 30,000 miles per hour, what kind of damage it would do. There was a mysterious explosion in Siberia in about 1908 that might have been due to a small comet exploding in the atmosphere. Essentially, this large region of uh, mostly uninhabited area had an entire forest that was, uh, all the limbs were stripped off the trees and most of the trees themselves were knocked over to the side. Of course, hopefully all of you have heard of this large explosion in Russia in 2012, where 1,100 people were injured, mostly by the exploding glass that they were looking out the windows and as the shock wave hit, caused the glass to shatter and lots of eye and facial in injuries. Uh, it was visible as a fireball as it went across the sky in the day. Um, they found actually small chunks of it. Here are pictures at a school of windows that were blown out. And you can see a dust cloud in the background as it hit a factory in Russia. Now there's other meteor craters that exist. In Quebec, there's a ring-shaped lake. And this is... Um, the result of a meteorite impact that struck any circular formation that we see on the Earth is probably caused by a meteor crater. Or in Hudson Bay, we see this vast circular arc here. That's in the islands in the middle. That's due to an object hitting here and creating a crater. And remember, in the middle of the crater, there's a, a peak. That's these islands here. Or there's a 
basin in Central Europe that's about 300 kilometers around that's due to a meteor impact. Of course, about 65 million years ago, at the end of the Cretaceous period, an asteroid or comet hit the Earth, exterminating the dinosaurs and many other life forms. Now, evidence for an extraterrestrial cause of the extinction is the high abundance of what's a rare ele element, iridium, that's in the sediments all around the world at about the same time. And the amount of iridium suggests about a 10 kilometer wide asteroid that hit the Earth. A 10 kilometer asteroid pr produced the explosion equivalent of several billion nuclear bombs. Now, most of that energy is um, so well, some of the energy is going through the atmosphere as it heats up, but the explosion will be quite spectacular. Initial destruction by high temperatures, the blast, and acid rain would have followed by months of darkness and intense cold as the sun's light is completely blotted out by clouds and dust. Now, further evidence of the impact is a layer of soot, tiny quartz pellets, and a circular depression um, in the Yucatan region of Mexico. So the question we might ask is, will another strike occur? There's actually a relationship between the size of an object and the probability of a collision. Now every year we get something that's about 20 kilotons of energy. Now most of that is um, uh, expended in the atmosphere as it goes through and creates a fireball and burns up, but sometimes they hit. Uh, Tunguska in Siberia, that's about a once every thousand years event. Uh, the one that we just had it was actually pretty close to that and so maybe it's at the once in a century since this was in 1900 and this was in 2012. Uh, every million years or so the earth has had what they call a global catastrophe threshold object that strikes it. So I want to go through now what different impact diameters do when they hit the earth. So let's say it's less than 50 meters in diameter about a 10 megaton yield. We get those about once a year. Even though they're 50 meters or half a football field in diameter, most of those don't reach the surface. They come in very fast and they burn up in the atmosphere. Our atmosphere actually protects us from quite a lot. About every thousand years we get a 75 meter impact diameter, which yields somewhere between 10 and 100 megatons of energy. Now, if it was iron, it's going to make craters like Meteor Crater. Uh, if it's made out of stone, it'll produce air bursts like Tunguska. A land impact could destroy the area the size of a city. At 160 meters around, uh, we get about 100 to 1,000 megatons of energy. We get one of those about every 5,000 years, and iron and stone hit grounds. Uh, icy ones, so comets, produce air bursts. And a land impact could destroy the area of a large urban uh, area, like New York or Tokyo. At 350 meters across, we get maybe 1,000 to 10,000 megatons of energy released. We get one of those about every 15,000. Land impacts could destroy the area of a small state, say Connecticut. Ocean impacts actually produce mild tidal waves. At 700 meters in diameter, get 10,000 to maybe 100,000 megatons of energy released about every 63,000 years. A land impact destroy an area the size of a moderate state, say Virginia. And ocean impacts make really big waves. And finally, an impactor of about 1,700 meters or a mile in diameter, you can get up to a million megatons of energy get one of those every quarter million years. Land impacts actually would raise dust that would have global implications and could destroy the area of a small, uh, large state like California or maybe France. So that's all that we want to talk about on small planetary bodies.